Good morning. I want to welcome you also, say thank you for being here and worshiping with us this morning. I uh, appreciate you all being here. Uh, I see that after last week talking about if we left the back pews open, people would gather with us. You all took that to heart. <laughs> I'm not joking. Uh, some of you are for, okay, okay but, but was that a choice or did you get in here late? There's a difference. Uh, no. Uh, seriously, though, come on up and join us once in a while. It's good up here. It is, you know how snowy and cold it is outside? It's really warm right here. <laughs> Warmth just emanates from this area. Um, no, this morning we're keeping up with our uh, study in Acts, and we're going to actually look at one of the men the apostles appointed to help with the ministry of the widows. And that one's Stephen. He's the very first one mentioned. If you go back to our text last week, um, it was stated that he was a man that was full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. What a designation for a believer. For someone to look at him, someone to write about him, he was a man that was full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. It just kind of sets him apart from the others. I mean, there was a list of gentlemen. There were seven guys' names there, I think. And, and, and his is, is just a little bit different in the way that Luke writes about him. And, and so we, we kind of can take from that. I, I titled this morning Model Witness. And that's part of the reason is he is a model witness for us to look to as an example of how to be Christ-like. Luke actually describes Stephen's life and his ministry as Christ-like. And in the end, we see that, that Stephen's martyrdom advances the mission of God. The reason we can actually look to Stephen as an example, though, isn't because it, he was just great in his own right, it was that he was imitating Christ. Much like we can say we look to Paul's example, not because Paul was great and wonderful in his own being, but because he followed Christ. He imitated Christ with his life. Stephen is much the same. The reality is the goal of, of, of any believer should be to be like our Savior. That's what we're called to, is a life that looks more and more like Christ. And so that's, that's where we're at. Paul, Paul even writes about it in Philippians. We, we should be growing more and more like Jesus, as was the aim of Paul and Stephen. And so, so we see Luke writes about Stephen's Christ-like character, his Christ-like ministry, and even his Christ-like death. And his death really is the first martyrdom that we read about in this book. Persecution, remember, it began with the threats and then we saw the, the apostles flogged. And here in a few chapters, you're going to see Stephen stoned to death. Talk about escalating quickly the opposition to the gospel. It moved fast. But our focus really isn't on his martyrdom today. This morning, I want us to really think on the witness that Stephen was. And I want us to really wrestle with a certain question. And, and you're going to go, well, that's a silly question. But but the question is, do I really want to be like Jesus? Do I really want to be like Jesus? Because like I said, you may go, well, that's a silly question. I'm sitting here in a chair on a Sunday morning when I could have just stayed home in the warmth of my home, not gotten out in the cold. Here I am. I even might have come to Sunday school. I'm going to put something in. It's not a silly question. It's one we really need to consider the truth of what our life looks like. To be like Jesus is very different than what we may think being like Jesus is. We really have to think about the implications of being like our Christ. Look at the life he lived. Look at the things he faced. To be like Jesus doesn't mean to simply gather some, some facts about his life and then imitate him to the best that we can. That, that's more like when children idolize a, a sports figure, right? They're going to be like, well, when I was young, it was be like Mike. I didn't watch sports. I didn't care, right? But my son's come to me. He's like, I'm going to play in the NFL one day. I'm like, good for you. He's like, I want to be like such and such. I'm like, who is that? He's like, oh, this guy right here. I'm like, great. But is he great? I'm like, I want to know about his character. I don't care what he does on the field. Well, he says this, and this. that's great that he says it. Let's watch for the next five years, and let's see if it holds true. 
But that's what we do. We kind of, we idolize these people. That's not what being like Christ is. It's, it's not idolizing him. We can't try to be like Jesus in our own power or, or, or imagine that we can earn salvation by copying what he did. The reason, the reason we can pursue likeness to Jesus is because we've been united with him. Through that union with Christ, we can live out Christ-like lives. Through Jesus, we're able to bear the fruit of righteousness. Stephen was not sinless. Just like the rest of us, he needed a Savior. And once he accepted Christ, he was empowered to live this life that really reflected who Jesus was. So let's go ahead and read our our passage uh, that Luke writes about Stephen in Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 8. Here's what it says. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Crinians and of the Alexandrians and as of the Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they say, secretly invested and instigated sorry, men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, All who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. It's a very interesting passage. And in the end, you might go, well, what's that about? We'll get there. We'll get to the part where his face looks like an angel. But Stephen Stephen was out there doing these miraculous things, these marvelous wonders in the midst of this people. But, But this was a group from another community among them that raised opposition against his teaching, against his preaching, and they enter into this dispute with him. Luke goes on and he says, they were really unable to, to, to resist the wisdom that he was spewing, right? They, they've come against him and he starts to speak and they can't, they can't really figure out how to get around what he's saying because he's so wise. Because what he says makes sense that the spirit is speaking through him. And they start by engaging him in this, this honest debate, but their honesty is very short-lived. They're unable to stop his arguments So they turn to corrupt manners in order to to, to silence him. They find these willing people that are are going to bear false witness against Stephen. They stir the people up. They get them all uh, angered and ready to go up against Stephen. They're like, you you won't believe what he's saying. They're lies. They're lying, but they're they're getting everybody gathered up. They get the, the elders and the scribes and they get together. They seize him. They bring him before the council. But not a word of what these false witnesses said was true, except that Jesus did say he was going to destroy the temple. But they twisted Jesus' words even. They, they, they twist his words as part of their grand conspiracy against Stephen. This, and, and remember, he, the way he speaks is so eloquent. The spirit is just, just I mean, he is just the, the mouth opening up for the spirit to speak through him. And they can't deny it. They know they can't. That's why they, they turn to these, these lies. Stephen had become the object of these hostile stares, and his accusers are, and the court are, are looking over him as he's being accused. And, and guess what they see? As they, as they sit there and they watch him and they hear these, these, these false witnesses, radiance starts to emanate from his face. And what they see is like, a, like the face of an angel. It's similar to what happens with Moses, right? Moses goes up and speaks to God on the mountain. And when he comes back down, he's got to veil his face because no one can look on him because he just looked upon God. It's like the Mount of Transfiguration where where Christ is transfigured. Now, now in this case, Stephen is more like Moses than Jesus. Stephen, he, he wasn't reflecting the ugliness and the horror reflected in the face of his accusers, but he was reflecting the grace 
and the loveliness of God that was just pouring forth. As we seek to follow Stephen, as he followed Christ, we've got to first be united with Jesus. We've got to be willing to follow, even in the suffering. But Stephen's story shows us that suffering connected to honoring the Lord is worth it. So as we walk through this martyr steps, we're going to note a few ways that Stephen points to Jesus, even, even ways that Stephen resembles him. We're going to look at three different ways this morning. And first, we see that Stephen had this spirit-empowered witness. Luke starts by telling us the source of Stephen's ministry, right? He previously had said that, that Stephen had a good reputation, that he was full of the spirit. He was full of wisdom. He was a man full of faith. When, when people look at us, do they note we are people of faith? I mean, answer that question honestly. When people look at you, do, is what they see a person of faith? They did with Stephen. Right? Stephen, they, they call him up. They, they commission him to go and, and serve and, and minister to the widows. And he comes up and he does that. He, 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 he does this, this, this ministry very faithfully. He follows God's leading. He accepts the responsibility that the church seeks of him. But his story doesn't end there. That's not all he did. That's where, that's where it began. Luke adds that Stephen was filled with grace and power. Stephen was a man filled with these gifts that God had blessed him with. God had poured out his grace on this man. The reality is, though, he pours out this grace on us too. We just sang a song about he's the same God. He's the same one that we read about in scripture. If he's doing it here, he can do it in us, and he does it for us. It wasn't because Stephen was a great man, it was because he allowed the Spirit to use him. He was faithful and obedient as in his witness and his ministry. And so the Spirit empowers Stephen to do greater ministry, which involves the caring for the widows. That's not negated here. But then he starts speaking and preaching and acting with wisdom. He starts to perform signs and wonders. In this way, Stephen followed the Master because Jesus was also full of the Spirit. Jesus was also full of wisdom. Jesus himself was wisdom. Look at what we read about Jesus over in Luke chapter 2. Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. This is who Jesus was. Now, when you read that, when, sometimes these type of verses can kind of strike you. It does me, and it goes a little puzzling, like, well, how can Jesus increase in anything? He's Jesus. He's God in the flesh. But what we're seeing here is, is Jesus was subject to the normal process of human growth, right? Intellectually, physically, spiritually, even socially. He was completely human. He developed as we do. Even as God, he, he, this is who he is. It doesn't mean he wasn't fully God, but he submitted the use of these divine attributes to the will of the Father, he said, I'm going to do what you want me to do. He, this is how it had to happen. This is how it had to be. And so he, he grows, he increases in this wisdom and this stature. This wisdom that was increased by God is what we see in Stephen's witness as well. The, the, this wisdom is also available to us. We should seek this wisdom out when we go to talk with others. If we seek it, if we accept it, then we need to use it. That's what Stephen did. The difference being that Jesus embodied the wisdom fully. He was wisdom. Look at what we read in Colossians 2. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's in Christ. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. This, this verse right here, it reminds us that wisdom is more than a set of principles. Wisdom is a person. When, when you are united with Christ, he makes you wise. When we're united with him, us and him, him and us, he's the one that makes us wise. He enables us to make sense of this life. Stephen, Stephen seeks out this wisdom. He embraces 
this wisdom. And then he uses it to minister to the world. Stephen seeks this wisdom so that he can, he's, it's not for selfish reasons. It's not so people will look at him and go, look how wise he is. It's so that he can point others to Christ. Are you asking God to fill you with, with his faith and his power and his wisdom? We've got to remember we're controlled by whatever fills us. If you're filled with jealousy, if you're filled with things like jealousy, when someone else experiences success, you're going to be infuriated. If you're filled with lust, sexual appetites are going to lead you to, to, to great darkness. If, if you're filled with anger, you're going to quarrel with someone. You're going to even murder them with your thoughts. But if you're filled with God's power and God's wisdom, you're going to live a life like Stephen demonstrated, a, a life of, 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 uh, that, that's others-oriented, that's, that's Christ-exalting. You're going to love. You're going to serve. You're going to glorify God in everything you do. If that's what you're filled with, I want us to take a note from Stephen's life. I want us to begin to ask God to fill us with faith and his power and his wisdom, not just so that we can have it, but so that we can use it to do his will, so that we can use it to do his mission. I want us to be able to point others to Christ at every opportunity. And sometimes, like I said, I get in my own way because I want to do it in my power. We've got to stop that. We've got to allow the Spirit to empower us to do these things. Let us be faithful and obedient as we witness to our world in this way. Let us allow him total access to our lives and gift us in a similar way as we see Stephen gifted. That way we, we can be a model witness for each other. We need that among us. We need to be able to look between us and go, I see faithful witnesses here at Smith Grove. People that are emulating Christ in everything that they do. The next thing we see is that Stephen uses this wisdom that God gives him. We see that he's continually speaking with unanswerable wisdom. You ever know anybody that just speaks to hear themselves speak? No? You've, you've never met anybody that just likes the sound of their voice. And so they talk incessantly. They don't say anything, but they talk. I, I can't believe like three of you know that person. And if it's you, you can laugh about it. It's okay. There are people, though. I, okay. I'm around a lot of pastors. And there are some that like to hear themselves just for the reason to hear themselves. I'm just speaking truth here. Maybe I'm one of them. Maybe I talk too much. Do I talk too much? Don't, let's not go into that now. <laughs> yeah, I should probably drop that. <laughs> if we're, if we're going to say something as represent, uh, representatives of Christ, it better be worth saying. I, I, I guarantee you, you would know the difference if I got up here and just started sharing Matt's life and story. And I'm sure it would entertain you, and I'm sure you would giggle, and you would probably gasp. But it's pointless if what I'm doing isn't pointing people to Christ. It's pointless as if when I open my mouth and all I share are the stories of what's going on in my world and it doesn't impact you and, and, and send you looking to him. I told First Service, once I retire, I think I'm going to go into to, to be a stand-up comic, right? I, I've, I've learned I think that's what ministry prepares you for. And when I do, I'm, I'm going to change all the names, don't worry. But also, most of my material will probably come from my four children and my dog. So... Uh, but if we're going to represent our God, when we speak, we need to do it with his wisdom. Don't just go spouting things off because you think it sounds good or because you think you know. Make sure when you're talking about him, it is with his wisdom. And that's what we see here. The, the Freedman Synagogue, this is amazing to me how God orchestrates everything, right? But this, this Freedman Synagogue that we're talking about, it was a, a Greek-speaking gathering that was comprised of former slaves from different locations. And the most entering, interesting uh, location mentioned is, is Cilicia, which seems to be Paul's home region. This, this means that the apostles 
probably attended this synagogue at some point, okay? That's where all this is taking place. And so the apostles have probably been here. If we, if we look at the context around it, Paul, who then was Saul, was probably the ringleader here. So the one stirring everybody up, the one coming to dispute Stephen, although he's not mentioned, there's a lot of, of, of things that point to it being Saul leading this whole, this whole uh, shenanigan. At this point in Scripture, Saul hates the gospel. Saul, Saul does not believe Christ is who he says he is. And so, so he and these others are disputing Stephen. And it may have went on for days. We don't know. But as is the case of Jesus' teaching, no one could withstand Stephen's wisdom. And the power of the gospel is illustrated through this, throughout this narrative. Consider Saul, right? Eventually, he's converted. He changes his name to Paul. And what does he do? He writes a New Testament theology that reflects exactly what Stephen speaks on in the next chapter. The one that was coming against him, the one that wanted him done away with, that, that wanted him out of the picture, is now preaching exactly, writing exactly what he was teaching. In fact, it's, it's likely that Paul personally shares this whole account with Luke, so it's recorded for the church. Is that not, it's unbelievable how God connects all that. You go over into chapter nine and you even see Paul disputing the, or Saul disputing the Hellenists after his conversion, declaring that Jesus is the Christ. His eyes were opened. He saw what Stephen was speaking of, although too late for Stephen. But now, now Paul knows the truth. And this most likely happened in the same synagogue powerful. Saul goes from accuser and persecutor to witness of Christ in the same place. So what gives Stephen this confidence? How, how can he stand up against of these religious bullies? I mean, he hadn't attended Bible college. He, he didn't have a seminary degree. He, he didn't have a gospel tract to memorize. The only thing he could be filled with this confidence by is for one reason. He believed who Jesus was. He believed the promises Jesus had made. Even, even this one particular one, he, he trusted in the words of Christ recorded in Luke chapter 21. Look at this. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness Settle it therefore in your minds not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. See, this, this is where Stephen finds his confidence. Confidence to speak with wisdom that couldn't be challenged. They couldn't, they couldn't come up with any way to defeat it other than lies. Do we remember Christ's words like this? Do, do we find comfort in, in him saying things like this? Or are we intimidated by these words? See, Stephen found comfort. He held to this promise that, that God, that, that Jesus would give him the words to speak. The Spirit would speak through him in a way that no one could question what he was saying. Do we believe those, those words? Do we hold to those promises? In Acts chapter 6 and 7, he's brought before these religious leaders, and then he's killed. And it's just what Jesus predicted, that if you spoke the truth of who he was, persecution would come, death even. He says to prepare for that. But before that happens, Stephen also gets to experience the other part of this passage, right? He's given an opportunity to share this unprepared message loaded with unanswerable wisdom. They bring him in and he starts speaking. He didn't have his little tablet. He hadn't had time to prepare for this. They sought him out and they yank him in. How many of us would be terrified if that happened? If you were in a place where you weren't free to speak the gospel and you did and someone heard you and they came and they yanked you in, how many of you would be ready to defend yourself right then and there? We should be because this is a promise of our God. This is a promise of our Savior. 
that the Spirit will give us these, these, these whiz, words of wisdom that no one can come against. That's the confidence we see here. That's the confidence that we can have to speak up about Christ, knowing that God will be with us when we stand before the wolves. At the end of every service, we're saying the Great Commission. Do you catch the last part of it? He tells us to go, but he doesn't tell us to go alone. He is with us always. So when we go out to speak about him, guess what? It's not you doing it. Let him do it through you. Let him speak through you. Know that he, he doesn't walk us up to the opportunity and then shove us along. Not like, you ever teach your kid to ride a bike that way? We're like, hold on, don't let go. And we always let go and fall down. That's not God. God's not going to take us up to it and say, okay, you're on your own. He goes the full way. He's the one that'll, that'll speak through us with this wisdom that we don't even know we have because it's his. Praise God that he is going to go with us. He is going to use us. He's going to give us the words to say if we'll just submit and follow him. We, we should not use this text as an excuse to not study the word of God. Don't think you get out of this if you think, I'm just I'm going to turn my back. I don't, want, I don't want that. If that's you, you need to revisit that question. Do I really want to be like Jesus? Because if we're not willing to give it all up for him, there's a problem. And it's very easy in the world we live in, in the place that we live in, the freedom that we have to say, oh, I would do it in a heartbeat. I would give my life for Christ. But if you're in that situation, would you still do it? We can talk a big game because we have freedom here to do it. The consequences we see around our world are not here yet. And so we've got to prepare. We, we, if, if we're going to be a faithful disciple like Stephen, we've got to embrace the promises that Jesus makes to us. Right here in this passage, we've got to allow him to speak through us. When we get confronted about our faith, especially by bullies... Let him take over. Let him be the one that brings the words and the things to say. But we have a responsibility to know his words, to know what his word says if we're going to speak about it. So get ready to read it, to study it, to know it, to apply it so that you can share it. God will grant you the wisdom to speak it. And Stephen obviously was studied up because, because he knew what it said. That, that's how he's able to retell the story of the Old Testament that appears in the next chapter, his sermon in chapter 7. At issue, here's the idea that, that we followers of Jesus are never alone when we live on mission. If we're going out to spread the word of God, he's with us. He's not going to leave us alone. So as you seek to advance the gospel among the nations, especially when sharing with hostile individuals, remind yourself of Stephen's witness. Look at what happened. They brought him in and he just opens his mouth and, and speaks clearly to a point that they can't deny it. Pray for God to give you an ability to speak his word with his power and his clarity, knowing that the sovereign Lord is with you and for you. You know what? If he's for you, guess what? Nothing else matters. Nothing can come against you. Finally, this morning, we see that Stephen, like Christ, was faithful even while enduring trials. These religious bullies, they, they decide that they're going to use the, the, the philosophy, if you can't beat them, bruise them. They're, they're trying to, to shut him down in any way they can at this point. They, they can't stand up to his wisdom, so they invent lies about him. They bring him before this court that's not really a court at all. What started with opposition in verse 9, it denigrates into to verses 11 through 15. These men opposed to Stephen conspire against him. They create this, this smear campaign. They cause his arrest. They cause him to, to be hauled before the council. And then they make him face these charges of false witnesses. You read over in Matthew 26 about how Jesus endured a similar bogus trial. Stephen was accused of speaking these blasphemous words about Moses and about God. They didn't like what he said. Well, they said, he said. 
about the temple and about the law. But in fact, you get to verse 15, and God has, has turned Stephen's face more Moses-like than ever. Here they're saying he's, he's making up stuff about Moses and about God, and, and God, in turn, has created this angelic face that, that resembles exactly what Moses looked like when he brought the law forward. God's not in that. Tell me that. That's just unbelievable to me. His speech, Stephen's speech, clearly shows honor for Moses. At no point does Stephen use God's name frivolously. Stephen simply taught that Jesus was the fulfillment of the law and the temple. Jesus is the substance. Those things were shadows. Jesus said the exact same things about himself. Thus, Stephen's a victim of the accusations that Jesus endured. This passage is a great reminder that we've got to tell everyone that if they want to meet God, they don't need to go to a temple or a building. They've got to go to a person. They've got to meet Jesus. If someone wants forgiveness, he or she, they they don't need to practice self-atonement. They don't need to offer God a sacrifice of bulls or goats, but everyone must go to Jesus trusting in his work on the cross of salvation. As we tell the good news that Christ is the Savior of sinners and stand on this truth, we have to be prepared to face opposition. We have to be ready to be excluded or mocked or misrepresented, even shamed, and at some point possibly killed for believing it. It has always been this way, and it will always be this way until our King returns. Like I said, I praise God that we live in a free nation where we've got the freedom to do this. But there's coming a time where we won't have the freedom. You can believe me or not, but I think it's closer than it's ever been. They're not going to see what we say as loving and kind. And when that time comes, we need to have prepared for what's going to happen. So don't give in to the temptation to try to make Christianity something it's not. When we, we as Christ followers are opposed, we're facing opposition against Him. It really has nothing to do with us if we're presenting Him as we should be. They're opposed to Jesus. Putting Stephen through this inquisition, th- these men in this account are essentially putting Jesus on trial all over again. They wanted to flog and kill Jesus all over again. That's, what's, that's how Christ-like Stephen was. You know that's what was going through their mind as they're doing this. This guy's just like Jesus. We can't have him out there doing this. Remember, Jesus promised that many are going to hate us because they hated him first. Look at, listen to what it says in John chapter 15. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Not a very comforting verse, is it? It's not what we want to hear because we want to be loved by everybody. We want everyone to like us. That's not what this is about. If we are a a representative of Christ as we should be, we've got to be prepared to be hated. We've got to be ready for such moments, remembering that we share this powerful intimacy with God as we identify with the suffering Savior in moments like these. Jesus Christ suffered. Guess what? We will too. The world will never love us if we proclaim a biblical gospel of Jesus Christ. Guess what? We're not called to be loved by them. We're called to present our Savior as we should. We've got to stick to biblical teaching. We can't fall to the trap of creating a false gospel just to be liked by everyone. We're going to suffer as Christ suffered. And if you haven't, if if you've suffered already, rejoice in that. And if you haven't, begin to pray now for his strength to help you through it when it happens. The other thing is, though, is if we share in his suffering, we also share in his resurrection power. That's the good side of this. Even though we're going to share in the suffering, we also have the power of his resurrection. Look what it says in Philippians chapter 3. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection 
and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. I think Stephen understood this, and that's why we see him stand and speak faithfully in this passage. Then, then we get to this last verse, and it, 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 it kind of transitions us to the next scene. Here, while Stephen's being unjustly treated, his face is like the face of an angel. It's just radiant. Now, it could be his change, uh, his change in countenance reflected the, the fact that God was standing by the side of Stephen. But I love this. It could also indicate Stephen's intimacy with God and his faithful representation of Moses. Here, these leaders had accused him of demeaning Moses. And now Stephen is reflecting the likeness of Moses who had to cover his face with a veil because it shone so brightly after he came down off that mountain speaking with God, spending time with God. That's how God works. They're making these claims that you, 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 you were blasphemous against Moses and God's like, oh, he wasn't. And look at him. You're going to see a similarity to who Moses was. In chapter 7, Stephen goes on to teach them how they should understand Moses. He goes into this. That's what we're going to look at next week, or at least start looking at next week is chapter 7. But here's where we end today. A look at this model witness for us to, to get a glimpse of what it's like to be full of faith, full of power, full of wisdom from God. And here's where I want you to, to be thinking as we, we move to our time of response is that one question, do I really want to be like Jesus? Look at where it led the apostles. Look at where it led Stephen. Look at where it leads believers all around our world. Do we really want to be like him? And I don't want you to answer flippantly. I don't want you to, to go, oh yeah, I'm ready. I'm here. I'm prepared. Look at his life. Look at what he calls us to. It's not for the faint of heart. Sometimes we make the life of a Christian look entirely different than what the Bible tells us it is. We make it more comfortable. We make it more palatable. We make it whatever we want it to be because it's our truth. There's only one truth, and it's his. And he tells us what it's going to be like when we follow him. Do you really want to be like Jesus? See, I want us to be a church. I want us to be a body that says, yes, we do. I want people to look at us and go, those are Christ-like people. They look more and more like him every time I encounter them. That's what I want for Smith Grove. That's what I want for you. I don't want a church full of people who, who like the idea of Jesus and like some aspects of him and want to follow that Jesus. I want them to follow the biblical Jesus that tells us, give up everything to follow me that tells us the world's going to hate us if we speak his truth. I want us to be a body that's ready to go to mission for him, no matter the cost. So as we move to this time of response this morning, that's what I want you to kind of wrestle with. And I used that word at the beginning, but we really do need to wrestle with that question. He doesn't call us to a, a casual faith. It's not just a part of who we are our identity. When we've given our heart to him, he paid for it. He bought it. He chose us. We're no longer our own. Do you really want to be like Jesus? My prayer is yes. It's time to, to step into your faith more. It's time to go deeper than you ever have. It's time to become a model witness like we see in Stephen's example so that we can be that model for each other and those in our community, those in our world. They're needed now more than ever. It's a big call on our lives, but it's one that He will go with us through. Let's submit. Let's be faithful. Let's be obedient in our response this morning. Let's stand as we pray. Father God, once again, I thank you for this passage that speaks of your servant, Stephen. Father, I thank you for... The, the, the model that we see of what it's like to be a faithful disciple, someone who, who follows and, and embraces the promises you've made and sees you bring them to fulfillment in their own lives. Father, I pray that you make us bold witnesses. I pray that you make us faithful witnesses. I pray that you make us obedient witnesses. 
So, Father, as we consider this question of do we really want to be like you, Father, open our eyes, open our hearts to the parts that aren't like you that we need to turn over to allow you control of. God, we, we thank you so much that you gave us your son so that we could know you. But, Father, it's not just about knowing you. It's about making you known, bringing you glory, pointing others to you. Help us to get that. Father, also help us to get that you don't leave us after it's happened. You go with us to do these things. You speak through us with your spirit. God, help us to to prepare for what you've got for us. Let us be a church that's going on mission constantly to see your name glorified, lifted up, so that, Father, more people may come to know you so that they can glorify you as well. So God, speak to us now. Help us to respond in the way that we need to. Open our hearts and our eyes to what you have for us. And we'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name.